this idea of returning to a pure or natural state of existence, of freeing the instincts and dealing with new conceptual realities. And think, for example, of Baudelaire's um, definition of genius from the Salon of 1846. I'm sorry, from the, it's actually from the Painter of Modern Life of 1863, in which he says, Child, I'm sorry, genius is nothing more nor less than childhood recovered at will, an idea that would have been fairly incomprehensible at the beginning of the 18th century. And if we see what, let's say, these two artists uh, said about such issues, in 1832, when Delacroix was in Morocco, he wrote in his journal, these people are closer to nature in a thousand ways, their dress, the form of their shoes, and so beauty has a share in everything they make. As for us and our corsets, our tight shoes, our ridiculous pinching clothes, we are pitiful. The graces exact vengeance for our knowledge. So you have this equilibrium between knowledge as something that carries within it a kind of corruption. Only 18 years later, Courbet wrote to Francis Ave that, and I quote, in our oh-so-civilized society, is that it is necessary for me to leave the life of a savage. I must free myself even from governments. The desire or need for primitivism was related to the ideal of living in a way that was unfettered by what Gauguin called the disease of civilization. Primitivism was associated with rejuvenation, liberation, a greater sense of spirituality and of individualism, a sense of inner realization and self-knowledge. And we see this as, a, as something that goes across the society in general in the early, let's say, the first decade or so of the 20th century. For example, Freud, in the post, uh, postscript to the Schreber case, 1911, writes, in dreams and neuroses, so our thesis has run, we come once more upon the child, and the peculiarities which characterize his modes of thought and his emotional life. And we come upon the savage, too, we may now add, upon the primitive man as he stands revealed to us in the light of the researches of archaeology and of ethnology. Now, culturally, primitivism involved the rejection of a number of things, of the industrialization and uglification of the world, if I can put it that way, against religious and social constraints, against repressive sexual mores, against a suffocating sense of historicism that had been growing throughout the 19th century, and against a growing sense of materialism and emphasis on material reality. Artistically, primitivism was against virtuosity, of exactly the sort that you see in Jerome's Artisan Model of 1895, against anecdote, illustration, and narrative in painting, against perceptual and conceptual norms as embodied in classical art and in academic painting. Instead, the early modernists, and I show you Matisse 1905 landscape and a Picasso 1910 painting, the early modernists were interested in the integrity of the art object as an independent entity. The work of art as the expression of a parallel world, often involving expressive deformations that departed from normative representation. And the notion of deformation is interesting here because it, since at least the time of Delacroix, it had been associated with originality, individuality, and even genius. The influential critic Messislas Goldberg wrote in 1908, that which is vulgarly called deformation is the very principle of human creation, our anima dei. Related to these values, the interest in African art was also part of two other artistic discourses, that of anti-classicism and the broadening interest in non-Western art. I show you the Metkuros on the left uh, with Polyclitus Doriferos on the right. In the early years of the century, there was a growing consensus among artists that the art which for a long time had been considered the best was not necessarily so. 
that primitives are, primitive and archaic arts, non-naturalistic, non-optical, such as archaic Greek sculpture and Italian primitive painting, were not only as good as, but were even better than the later, more naturalistic arts of classical Greece and the High Renaissance. Non-European art occupied a somewhat similar terrain, potentially, to that that African art would come to occupy, um, and, or I should say that, uh, that archaic arts uh, would occupy, including, by the way, medieval art in a general way, with the added advantage of being exotic. I show you a Utamaro print on the left with a Fong sculpture. And this, of course, points to something that's essential and has to do with why the influence of African art wasn't felt until around 1906. And that is that African art was different from these other archaic and exotic arts for a number of reasons. First, it had no known historical development. And this, of course, fit in very nicely with the colonialist viewpoint that these people are peoples without history, or perhaps, to put it more accurately, these are peoples who have no history until they encounter us and they enter history. Its subjects were not known. It had the iconography, as we would call it, was uh, mysterious. Its meaning seemed to be carried primarily by formal values, not burdened with circumstantial surface details and optical effects. The very generalized modeling, which is a characteristic of so much uh, African sculpture. And so it was held more directly to express ideas. In fact, the sculptor Mayol uh, made a very interesting comment in 1920 that African art expresses more ideas than Greek art. Also, African art seemed to have no narrative content, and what it depicted seemed direct and simple, man alone and naked. It was comprised mostly of sculpture in wood as opposed to painting, and this is absolutely crucial because painting was then the dominant art form in Europe. And in fact, I think one of the things that Af the, the, the presence of African art played over the course of the 20th century was to help unseat painting from its absolute uh, dominance over um, sculpture. And as we'll see in a few minutes, sculpture also have had a very precise ideological charge in the late 19th and early 20th century. So when we think about why African art wasn't seen, wasn't looked at seriously before 19, uh, 1906, we also have to remember that it was on view. There had been a good deal of African art at the 1900 uh, World's Fair that both, let's say, Matisse and Picasso, among others, saw, um, but it seemed to have had no effect at all whatsoever. It was also um, on view at the Musée du Tracadero in Paris. I show you a display case um, in 1888 from that museum in which, as you can see, the objects are, are jumbled together with very little concern for the objects themselves, but a, a much greater concern with the overall symmetry of the presentation. And so one of the things that we want to think about is why? Why did, did this not happen until 1906? And I think that it's because the consideration of African objects as art had to be accompanied by a conceptual shift about Africa itself, which would allow for a taxonomic shift about the material objects that were produced there. In fact, this encounter, I think, has to do with a simultaneous taxonomic and morphological shift. That is, African art had to be called art rather than curiosities. And their apparently bizarre forms had somehow to be incorporated into the pictorial structures that Western artists were then using. 